Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started on the next session. Uh, before we start, if you are just joining us, uh, go ahead and if you have any questions, submit those to the Q&A module and not the chat. That will be for troubleshooting. Um, also, um, if you wanted to look at the Fuller Brief program, uh, you can go to our website, newprairiepress.org uh, forward slash cpndam. Um, and also, we are going to record this session so it's available after the conference if you want to go back and watch it along with the presentation slides. But our next uh, presentation is hopefully... All right, I'm assuming it's MAMA, <laughs> I might be wrong on that, uh, Master's Objects Migration and Metadata Mapping Activity, and this is going to be presented by uh, Daniel Noonan and Darnell Melvin. Uh, Dan is an eRecords Digital Resource Archivist, and Darnell is the Metadata Transformation Librarian, and they are both from Ohio State University. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Yes, that, that is Mama, and as I was just uh, saying, Darnell, I probably should have had sticks playing in the background doing some renegade. Oh, Mama, I'm in fear for my life and the long arm of the law. But anyhow, good morning. Um, Darnell and I will be leading you on a brisk trip, um, exploring your adventures in migration from organized chaos to a Fedora Hydra-based preservation environment. I will set the stage with a brief history of our digital preservation efforts and then provide an overview of our project planning and migration prep activities. Darnell and I will then, Darnell will then navigate us through the seas of identifying, transforming, and normalizing our metadata prior to ingest. Lastly, we will identify our existing challenges as our migration activities move forward under full steam. Uh, so a long time ago in a library far, far away, a story whose origins are lost in the midst of time, or at least more than a decade ago. No one can say definitively that this is what happened, but it is what I've been able to piece together along with my own firsthand knowledge over the past 10 years. Outside of a couple of big digitization projects dedicated to brittle books and theses and dissertations, the bulk of digitization efforts that were conducted by our special were conducted by our special collections and archives personnel at OSU. As they began to fill our departmental shared drive space with their projects, the libraries began to run out of digital storage space. To accommodate this growing digital mass, the library's IT department pulled an old web server out of mothballs to create a shared drive simply known as K. Sometime around a decade ago, that drive became unstable and its contents were unceremoniously placed on a server known as DSpace4. This gave rise to the myth that the collections were being preserved in DSpace. No, DSpace 4 was just a server used for staging DSpace upgrades and ingests and just happened to have some excess capacity. With the dumping of the K drive server space contents onto DSpace 4 and not into DSpace itself, we ended up with all sorts of digital materials on this server. We had inadvertently created the dark archive with little or no consideration for what we were putting there not only did we get digital masters, but derivatives, working files, and various detritus. However, a key benefit of the Dark Archive is that it did, still does, provide controlled access through SFTP. As such, the libraries did subsequently begin to take more prescribed efforts and steps in deciding what to put onto the server while carving out a new K drive space to actively work on projects. However, this did not curtail excessive amounts of duplication of masters and derivative objects, nor were there any official policies surrounding its use. And lastly, good file management policies, techniques, and processes were not used, nor in many case, cases basic metadata created. Now, in 2012 and 2013, a team from OSU Libraries participated in the DigiSeeker Institute. Our project was the development of a digital preservation policy framework that began to set the stage for migration to a true preservation environment. This effort dovetailed with the hiring of our head of a digital initiatives, Terry Reese, who is the chief architect of our new Fedora Hydra preservation environment. In 2014, he spearheaded the Master Objects Repository Task Force, which laid out a framework for our digital preservation activities, including defining what master and derivative objects are, defining the environment and the high-level management processes for a master object repository, within our library's digital storage environment, and recommending procedures for proper deposit and registration of appropriate objects in the master object repository, including workflow and metadata management and for metadata management and identification purposes, 
including interactions with other systems as appropriate. The recommendations were software and hardware agnostic to allow for digital master objects to be migrated to and preserved on future storage platforms. And subsequently in 2015, the libraries decided to implement a Fedora repository solution using Hydra-based Sufia for our user interface. So where to start? As early as 2011, the libraries engaged a retired librarian to conduct a rudimentary inventory of our digital stuff. I inherited this inventory that covered not only items in our dark archive, but also our DSpace repository known as the Knowledge Bank. Also on our shared drives and items on loose media. Through, our educated, through some educated interpretation and swagging, I estimated that we had upwards of 14 terabytes that likely needed to find a home in a true preservation environment. One of the things this inventory lacked was a comprehensive look at the dark archive and its content. And oh yeah, the libraries had put another K drive in place to ostensibly work on digitization projects. As we began to examine the dark archive, one thing we were certain of was that there was and is a significant amount of duplication within the dark archive and the replacement K drive, as well as with the Department of Committee shared drives uh, Department and Committee shared drives. In conjunction with the development of the Digital Preservation Policy Framework, we started to conduct a deduplication effort of the Dark Archive where we identified over 215,000 duplicates. This was driven by the fact that we were running out of digital storage space at the time. Working with our IT infrastructure support group, we developed spreadsheets that identified file paths for duplicate pairs and sometimes triplicate, quadruplicate, or more. In sharing these with the responsible collection archivist or curator, we discovered that they also likely had copies on the K drive or maybe even the J drive. So we did a dark archive versus K drive analysis with the intention of re retiring the use of the K drive again and making certain all masters were in the dark archive and derivatives were distributed to their appropriate access points. By mid 2014, we had made significant headway of deduping the dark archive and finally retired the K drive. 2015 saw the implementation of our Fedora Sophia platform, whose pilot content was library collections content that was migrated from an external system that another campus entity no longer supported. In preparation for the migration of contents from the dark archive, we identified more than 85 file types and nearly 2 million objects that needed to be considered for migration. The good news was that 52% of those were TIFF images that for the most part should be a no-brainer for migration. The next largest quantity of these were JPEGs, which may be masters or derivatives, documents, the bulk of which are PDFs, XML, which may be metadata, but the bulk of which are poorly formed faux XML, various audiovisual files, databases, spreadsheets, PowerPoints and web files, and zip files whose internal contents would need, still need to be examined. There are remaining 6% of obscure file types that may or may not need to be migrated or are the result of poor file naming practices. We now knew how many things we had, but who did they belong to and how do we prioritize the migration of more than a million items? And oh, what about the metadata that will be needed? Because one thing is absolutely clear, nothing goes into the master ops repository without a minimum amount of metadata. Now, before I turn it over to, to Darnell to discuss metadata and workflow, let's look at how we approach the prioritization. Fortunately, the Dark Archives folder structure is set to coincide with collection owners. Right off the bat, we put 47% of those files on the back burner as they are either master objects or support files for items in the knowledge bank. Those will be the last files we examine when we determine a strategy for interaction between the DSpace repository and Fedora. Nearly a quarter of the files account for 11 collections within the university archives, which are mostly from the Office of the President's Document Management System. The remaining files, just shy of 30%, belong to six groups spread over approximately 150 collections, which means a lot more detailed analysis. I constructed an access database based upon the file pass in the dark archives that was then shared with the appropriate archivists and curators that presented the file path and the quantification of file types within, and then ask them to identify the collection the items belong to, ask them whether the other objects that belong to this collection and where they're located, whether the objects should be migrated, disposed, or need of further processing or further assessment, 
What type of objects were these? Are they preservation masters, provisional masters, working copies, access copies, or maybe just reproduction copies? Are these preservation formats? Does the collection level and individual metadata exist? And if so, where do we find it? What are the intellectual property rights? Are they public domain? Are they owned by OSU? Are they owned by the donor? Is it mixed or maybe possibly in a lot of cases unknown? And what type of access are we allowed to provide? Is it public, reading room only, private, maybe only to the curatorial staff, or are they closed until some point in time in the future? This allowed us to begin to prioritize the migration by identifying those collections with the most available metadata and in which we can provide public access. And an additional wrinkle that will shortly go away is that the only file profile our existing metadata model, our existing data model could handle was that of images, which are simple objects. Therefore, our highest priorities were those collections that were TIFF or mostly TIFF that were single object and were of single object nature. Secondary considerations were given to other image types, followed by documents, complex objects, and audiovisual objects. With upgrades to Fedora and Sophia that are currently being deployed, we should shortly be able to accommodate and ingest the other data models that are included, that include complex objects and other non-image files. And with that, I will turn it over to Darnell. Thanks, Dan. So as, all, as you all know, metadata can sometimes be messy, complex, incomplete, inconsistent, non-existent, and the quality can vary from resource to resource and collection to collection. Good metadata can increase discoverability, enhance the user experience, and identify the parties involved in the creation or contributions of a given work. Good metadata can also act as an access point to the collections or resources once ingested into the repository. As the slide states, metadata truly is a love note to the future. Before we begin our work on this migration project, a lot of preparation was put forth to develop a, a blueprint for metadata mapping. This led to the creation of the Digital Collections Metadata Application Profile, which was an effort of the University Library's Metadata Working Group. The application profile is a group of metadata elements, attributes, and data values, which includes policies, guidelines, and examples for resources intended to be stored in the master objects repository. The elements defined in the application profile were drawn from established metadata schemas, such as Dublin Core, VRA Core, and Premise. Also, there was a subset of the application profile called the Master Objects Migration Metadata Guidelines. This serves as a core set of metadata elements that are required and recommended as a minimal level of metadata for ingestation. In addition to the application profile, we also recommended to our stakeholders to utilize established content standards and controlled vocabularies. Examples of potential recommended content standards includes CCO, DAX, RDA, the International Standard to represent dates and times, and the extended date-time format. Examples of potential controlled vocabularies include Art and Architecture Thesaurus, DCMI type vocabularies, International Standards for Language Codes, the Library of Congress subject headings, and the Getty Thesaurus for geographic names. Since multiple special collection units are ingesting content into the Master Objects repository, we needed an application profile that was robust, but also flexible for a wide variety of stakeholders and actions. Tools used. The four common tools used um, for this project includes the Oxygen XML Editor, Excel to generate spreadsheets, some type of relational database such as Access or MySQL, OpenRefine, and a locally developed bulk import tool designed to ingest simple and complex objects into the Master Objects repository. So let's turn to discuss the workflow. Step one, data export. The first thing that needs to happen is to get our collection and item data out of the legacy system. 
In our case, that legacy system is past perfect. Past perfect has the ability to export a number of file formats. In our case, I needed the data structured as XML. For those of you who have not worked with past perfect before, there are four types of collection modules in the system. There's objects catalog, photo catalog, archives catalog, and a library catalog. Our special collections primarily utilize the objects catalog and the archives catalog. The second thing that needs to happen prior to export is determining what metadata fields are needed. For the collections in the objects catalog, I exported all object identifiers, object names, dates, temporal data, titles and alternative titles, creators and contributor fields, descriptions, classifications, subject headings, medium data, language data, provenance data, measurements, location data, and any public or staff generated notes. For the collections in the archives catalog, I exported the same fields previously mentioned with the addition of including scope and content notes and abstract notes. Next, it will be necessary to create an inventory spreadsheet, which will include a column for the file path leading to the resources and a column for the corresponding past perfect object identifier. Step two, metadata transformations using XSLT. So after reviewing it, the exported data from past perfect, I noticed that the data was well structured but will need to be reformatted to comply with the metadata application profile. This is where XSLT comes into play. I created two transformations to deal with these issues. Template one does five tasks, which includes removing the past perfect schema from the XML file. Two, generates metadata elements and values for constant data for each item. Those include elements such as resource type and collection identifiers. Three, it re renames all metadata elements to comply with the application profile. So for example, we have a past perfect element name, object names, which also maps to the VRA core work type. We also had a user defined field one, which maps to an alternative title field. Also a user defined field 11, which deals with language codes. Four, parse out and add to their own element nodes. So in past perfect, all subject headings and keywords are exported out as one long string and will need to be parsed out to their own separate elements. And then five, the template normalizes white space in the description field. And I'm not sure if that um, white space was introduced during data entry or is just a quirk of the past perfect system. Template two automates numbers, uh, the subject fields, uh, auto numbers the subject fields um, once the metadata is in their own node. This is needed to differentiate multiple subject headings for an item once they are in the spreadsheet. Step three, XML schema mapping to Excel. To Excel. Before we can import an XML file to our collection and item data into the spreadsheet, Excel requires the XML structure to be mapped before import. I do this by taking two item records from the transform XML file and save it as a new file. Once in Excel, we use it to map the XML structure, which becomes the header of the spreadsheet. Once mapping is complete, you can then proceed to import your collection. Another option is also importing the schema and linking it directly to the Excel as well. Step four, database merge. In this step, we import our two spreadsheets into a database and they become two tables. The first spreadsheet is the collection, which includes item records. The second spreadsheet is our inventory file. And once both tables are in the database, we then run a query statement that interjoins the two tables by matching on the past perfect object identifiers. So after running the query, what we get is a new table that has the file path merged with its corresponding metadata. This new table is what we will use for bulk ingest into the master objects repository. 
Step five, data cleanup and quality control. In this phase, we do the final cleanup on the data in the spreadsheet, which includes date formattings, name formattings, verifying all items has a unique title, and color profile mapping to our resources. Here, we need to save the spreadsheet as a CSV file and encode it as a UTF-8. Once the data has been cleaned and the files is saved, we send this final spreadsheet to the Special Collections Curator to review the spreadsheet. Once they give us the feedback and the OK, it's time to ingest. We also have a subroutine where we update our finding aid and or catalog record. Now that the QC has been completed, we want to make sure that if any changes to the, con the content has been made, we want those changes to be reflected in the finding aid and or catalog record if one exists. This task is done by forwarding a detailed report to our special collections processing coordinator, which lists all the changes and their staff will make all changes if needed. So to look at how these steps fit together, here is a flow chart that illustrates the workflow. We have our past perfect data, which exports out our collection XML here in the green. We then run our two transformations with the blue circle, which produces a transform collection XML. Now from there, we take our snippet in step one, map this into a new spreadsheet, and then from there, step two, we import it into an Excel, a new Excel table. And then step three, we add our collection, and then on the second tab, we add our inventory, the blue, the blue square. Now from this Excel table, we'll then import these two tables, the inventory and the transformed collection XML, into two different tables in our relational database. Run our query, which produces another table, which can be exported out as an Excel file. And then we'll do a iterative process to verify that we've got all our information. If it passes, it will move on to the data collection and the data cleanup. If it fails, we'll go back and also run the statement again to grab all objects and resources we need. We run through our data cleanup phase, produces our clean uh, Excel merge sheet, and then we forward that off to QC, to our curators. If that passes, we'll go into, uh, import it into our digital collection system and our master objects repository. If it fails, it will iterate back to the data cleanup phase and keeps repeating that process until uh, the curators uh, okay and check off on the the final spreadsheet. And then here our subroutine. Did the curators make any changes to the spreadsheet? If no, we're fine and finished with the import. If so, we need to also send our report and then they will make the updates to the finding aid and or catalog record. So in conclusion, we'd also just like to point out a few of the challenges we've had have had, still have, as we're moving forward. Um, staffing. Both for the development effort as well as the curatorial and metadata efforts, we just haven't had enough staff to make it happen as fast as anyone would like to see it accomplished. Developer churn created issues early on, but we are relatively stable and staffed up now. As for metadata transformation, Darnell is it. And the archivists and curators try to find time to create metadata while doing the rest of what they do, hence the need for clear prioritization. Complicating the migration prioritization was our self-imposed limitation for images only. Fortunately, that limitation is about to be lifted. Another challenge has been a dependence upon the Fedora, Hydra, and Sophia communities. That is not meant to throw slings and arrows at them. It is just that without the expertise on our staff, we are reliant on community development for all the cool stuff we want to do, or sometimes basic functionality that our archival and curatorial staff expect. Lastly, one thing that will keep us adrift and chasing down that elusive treasure is metadata and the spotty metadata that we've had and the time and effort it takes to create good metadata. So thank you and we are ready for questions. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And uh, I don't have any question right now. 
Actually, I do have one. Uh, how long did this take? Because you have two million items. Seems like uh, the process, the chart, the, the workflow chart looks pretty complicated. How long did it take? Well, right now we're we're just starting. So we've you know maybe well I would say the the initial migration of some content from an old system was probably twenty to thirty thousand records. The migration currently that that we're just embarking on we've we've. Um, through the development changes that the system's been going through, um, we've done some test uploads of upwards of how many, four or five thousand at this point. No, more than that. Okay, probably upwards of maybe ten. Ten thousand. Okay. So I mean, we've got a ways to go now. Um, as of this week, actually, as of noon today, Eastern Standard Time, they're supposed to be launching the new upgraded system, so that we can begin to move forward a bit more systematically now with our our. Um, uh, uh, migration efforts. It's going to take a while. We started, I started the project planning of uh, really moving forward with the curators about a year ago. And I think there was some expectation at that time we'd be close to being done by now. But as I said, there just hasn't been enough time as well as other setbacks that we've had along the way. I would say that our goal now is to about a year from now to have fully migrated the stuff out of that dark archive and, you know, be truly on the path to true preservation. <laughs> The next question is, was there cross-training involved? If yes, how was this accomplished? Was there problems with working with other departments? Can you repeat the question, please? Was there cross-training involved? If yes, how was this accomplished? Was there a problem with working with other departments? Yeah, there, there was definitely a, a training component to it. Um, prior to moving any of the collection um, data, we often consulted with the curators um, to generate metadata, especially with the varying degree of quality of metadata. Um, the curators are the subject experts, you know, and so at least in my portion of this project, um, I had to work with them to help automate some things. I mean, because we're dealing with millions and millions of files and objects. Um, so there was, there was this almost consultation to, uh, bridge their subject expertise with the technic, the technical issues of the system and being able to migrate this stuff from one system to another. And I guess what I'd add to that is Darnell is in one department. I'm in another department. I'm in a department with the curators. So I'm kind of there point in their lead on this. And then there's the third department that plays into this. And that's, that's the, the, the folks on the, the IT side that are doing the development. So yes, it, it has been a cross-departmental effort. And to the extent that the, I think the cross-training that's involved here is more of getting the curatorial staff um, up to speed on utilizing the tools for the metadata creation and review um, prior to ingest. Currently, the, the, the curators themselves are not actually doing ingest. At some point, they will, but right now, that's being handled by Darnell or other folks on the, the um, IT staff. Another question, how did you go about analyzing, discovering duplicates in the storage? Is there a tool that, uh, that does this? That, that was done. I, I can't say exactly what tool was used. That was done. I was working with um, our infrastructure, IT infrastructure folks, and they ran a routine um, on the server that looked at hash values. And so we would get a report, and it was, it was in a, a log file that could then be parsed into a, um, a CSV that we could then pull out in a spreadsheet that listed the duplicates. And like I say, sometimes it's triplets or quadruplicates or even more, especially if you had um, zero byte files, those all come up as the same hash. Um, they would get listed in a spreadsheet, and so then I could go through and, and um, based on the string, pull out things that belong to a particular collection for them to look at, you know, which is the legitimate one and which is the one that we want to get rid of. Um, so it was, it was a mixture of our IT folks that, I'm not sure once again what they're using on the, the server side to actually run the hash and, and generate the report, but then I take that into CSV and, um, and Excel to, to, to do the final analysis with the curators. Uh, the next question is, has the connection analysis tool been incorporated into the special connections and archive uh, processing workflow? So this work is done on the front end? 
That will be some of the next steps. One of the things that's adjunct to this project is, is that we have to develop um, workflow uh, for both um, born digital collections, because some of this material is born digital collections that we've acquired um, that sits in the Stark archives, and the other things are those things that we actively convert. And so one of the things that I will be working with the um, uh, colleagues of Darnell's in the Special Collections Access and Description work group is what will those workflows look like um, as we move forward now that this new system is in place. So no, they're not there yet, but they're coming. And also, you got to remember, this project is primarily legacy uh, data and resources. Moving forward, we have a preservation program in place. So new stuff that we'll be ingesting into the system will have a lot more, we'll have a lot more control and handled of those resources. Right, so I think the, the, the other process that, that you know, I will be working on with Special Collections Access Description and our Headed Digital Initiatives is, and, and this is more on the born digital side, is how do we bring to bear digital forensics tools and those workflows and using things like BitCurator to, um, you know, get us to the point where when we're acquiring things from a donor or we're acquiring things from, you know, in our case within the university that are electronic records, how do we process those through so we still get them into this master option repository doing some of these, these steps? Okay. Uh Another question is, who is doing the quality control of the metadata, especially if more than one content standard is being used? Yeah, so um, the quality lies within the, the content standards and the controlled vocabularies we use. We, we have multiple special collection units, and they've all, not one shoe, one size fits each uh, special collection unit. So we recommended um, a series of content standards and controlled vocabularies that would work with the curators and their end users. Um, our, our process is definitely metadata driven and standard driven, but we needed um, the create, uh, which goes back to our application profile, we needed something that was flexible but yet robust, like I mentioned in the presentation. Uh, is the bulk is the bulk import tool open source and available for others to use? I believe it will be in the future. I would have to double check on that because we're as as members of the Fedora and the Hydra and the Sophia communities, the stuff that we're developing, I believe, would be made available for repurposing to other institutions. I mean, that's. I mean, we we benefit from the other institutions that are that are working towards these tools and on these tools. And the same thing is, is I believe we're contributing back. Um, I could certainly um, get a specific answer on that and follow up through Amanda uh, for the group if that makes sense. Uh, next one is are you. Are your X, XSLT scripts available for others to use? Um, currently, uh, they're not. But um, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of people have been asking to share those resources, and I believe at a at a later time, I I will make it make them available. Um, but as of right now, um, we're still I'm still in the development of uh, writing more scripts and adding them to the templates and stuff as we go deeper into these collections. Uh, the next question is, uh, did you find a step five, uh, step five quantity control took the longest time, time-wise in your workflow? Yeah, I could agree with that. It's, um, you know, uh, we're, we're all, we're all working on multiple projects. This isn't just a project where we're, uh, uh, using our time full time on this. So there is a lot of downtime between dealing with the subject experts as well as, um, getting this stuff ingested. So I, I think you're, you're right to say that um, the quality control probably takes a significant uh, portion before we can actually ingest it in. I think some of your development of the transformations are a lot of back and forth and back and forth to get them right. But once you've got the process in place, we have a process that's reusable then. And so that becomes a much less effort on the going forward. And the QA kind of is constant where that takes eyeballing to do that right. Yeah, that's correct. Well, I don't have um, first more questions here. Thank you very much for both of you for the wonderful presentation.
And uh, uh, if anybody has a further question, please send to Amanda and uh, we will uh, forward to the presenters and the uh, question will be answered uh, by email. And uh, uh, we're gonna take like a uh, some time to set up for the next uh, presentation. The next presentation will start at noon at Cent Central Standard Time. Thank you all.